So we have established our foundational understanding of the nervous system by discussing neurons and how they function and how they fire. Hopefully the activities in class over the last few days have been beneficial for you to understand that process. So now we're going to move out into the broader whole and discuss the nervous system in general. And then we're going to move into the endocrine system and how that influences behavior and mental process. So nervous system consists of all nerve cells, and this includes neurons, okay? It is basically an electrochemical communication system throughout your body, and the electrochemical aspect is, is the neuron and your neurotransmitters. The central nervous system is made up of your brain and your spinal cord, and that's it. It's the center of your body, and hence central nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system is what extends out from the central nervous system. So the sensory and the motor neurons that carry and connect to the central nervous system and extend it out to the rest of the body. So very important that you are able to differentiate those. We will do a graphic organizer with one another to attempt to kind of complete this breakdown and make it a little bit easier to see the different subsets of everything. So your central nervous system made of your brain and your spinal cord. Brain is the control center of your body, okay? So think of it like a computer. It's constantly crunching numbers and basically helping you to complete any level of process in your daily life. The spinal cord is kind of like the super highway, so to speak. So that means that it transmits those messages from the brain out to the body and from the body into the brain. Your peripheral nervous system has two subsets. It has the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system, or the SNS, controls voluntary movement and communication. So this involves any level of voluntary movement and communication from your sensory organs. Um, so another way to look at that would be your skin, your eyes, any level of sensory organ that you have, this is going to fall within the, that involves voluntary movement, this will fall within the somatic nervous system. You control these items. They don't just happen. And a lot of times it might seem like an automatic process to you, but think about it. As you're sitting here and you're doing these notes, your hand and your pen are moving as you write things down. You voluntarily picked up that pen and you're carrying out that movement voluntarily. You don't need it to, to be able to function, okay? Your autonomic nervous system, on the other hand, it controls the involuntary functions. Things like breathing, blood flow, heart rate, digestion. These are automatic processes. If you think in a logical sense, if you had to actually sit there and t say to yourself, all right, lungs, breathe. A lot of us would be dead because we would forget to constantly remind ourselves, hey, we need to breathe. It's those vital functions that are automatic for us, and that's a good way to remember the autonomic nervous system as opposed to the somatic. Autonomic sounds like automatic. So these are all of those involuntary functions that you need in order to be able to survive. So that's the difference between these two. So as if we haven't confused you enough, there are actually two subsets to the autonomic nervous system. You have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So in the sympathetic section, this is the division of the autonomic nervous system that gets your body aroused physically, physiologically, and mentally, okay? So it helps to make you alert. It helps you to be ready to act in any level of stressful situation whether it's positive stress or negative stress. So the way that we refer to the sympathetic nervous system, it is your fight or flight response. On the other hand, you have the parasympathetic nervous system. This is what helps to bring you back into a resting state. So once you've been geared up into that state of attempting to be ready to react during a stressful time, your parasympathetic nervous system is going to bring you back down and it'll keep you relatively calm. This is, uh, another way to look at it would be to call this the rest and digest section of your body. So it might be very helpful for you to write those down. If you look at 
this visual breakdown, you can see that the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems basically work in conjunction with one another. So the sympathetic nervous system, since it's all about getting you to be aroused to a point of being able to deal with a stressful situation, your heartbeat will accelerate. Since you have more blood pumping through your, your pupils will dilate. One thing that the sympathetic nervous system does that many kids don't recognize, it suspends what it perceives to be unnecessary processes in your body to give that energy to where it perceives to be necessary. So when you're very stressed out, whether it's physical stress, you're running a mile, um, or even in a time when you are freaking out because you have three exams on one day, what your sympathetic nervous system is going to do is it will suspend things like digestion. It will tell your stomach that it doesn't need to digest things anymore. It doesn't need to waste that energy. It needs to be sent somewhere else. It will come down and to move to your bladder and your kidneys and tell you that you don't need to go to the restroom anymore. And so this is the structure of how the sympathetic nervous system will work. Once your body recognizes that it's no longer needing to be in a highly alert stage, your parasympathetic calming system is gonna come into effect. It will make the pupils constrict instead because there no longer needs to be that additional blood flow. It will slow the heartbeat down it will tell the stomach that it's okay to start digesting things again. It will tell your bladder and your kidneys down here that it's okay to let you know you need to go to the bathroom now. And so this is how it operates for us when we are finding ourselves either in the rest or digest stage or the fight or flight stage. When we're talking about the nervous system, it's important to understand the different structures of neurons that we have within it. And there are three key types. The first is a sensory neuron. This is referred to as afferent. These are going to carry the incoming information from the sense receptors to your central nervous system. So this is gonna take information, for example, like from your fingertips, and it will send it all the way into the central nervous system, your spine and your brain. Intraneurons are gonna act as messengers between these guys down here. These are called motor neurons, and they're referred to as efferent. These carry information from your central nervous system back out to muscles and glands. So interneurons act as intermediaries, okay? They're in-betweens, so to speak, between the afferent and efferent neurons within the central nervous system itself. So I'm going to give you guys a little diagram here. It might be helpful for yourselves to keep in mind. So let's say right here we have the dendrites on the skin of your hand, okay? The afferent neurons are going to take this piece of information of you, uh, you know, touching something and they will send it down through into your spinal cord and it will send it to an intraneuron right here in your central nervous system. This intraneuron will send that info to the motor neuron right here and the motor neuron will send the information back out from the central nervous system to your muscles and your glands. Okay, So you can see the colors differentiated here to help yourselves. Blue is the sensory neuron bringing the information in. It is connected to an interneuron, which is yellow here, within the central nervous system. So this would be like your spine right here. And then it is connected to the motor neurons that will send that message back out to the muscles and the rest of the body. Let's talk endocrine system real fast. This is the body's slower chemical communication system. Please notice that I say chemical here as well. A lot of times kids get confused because they automatically assume if we're discussing chemical messages and communication, it means hormones in the endocrine system. That's not entirely correct. The same things that can operate as neurotransmitters in your nervous system can also function as hormones in your endocrine system. So very important that you keep in mind that both of these structures in terms of their system makeup deal with chemical messages and communication. It's just their means of transmission is different. Nervous system, it's gonna go through neurons. Endocrine system is gonna go through your bloodstream. So you might wanna write that, that down for yourself. Under normal circumstances, your endocrine system is going to work in conjunction with your parasympathetic nervous system. So that subset of the autonomic nervous system to sustain your basic bodily processes. In a crisis, the endocrine system is gonna to work to support your sympathetic nervous system. So by that we mean 
it's going to help gear you up and get that energy necessary for the flight, fight or flight response. So the endocrine system in times of stress works hand in hand with the sympathetic nervous system. And we'll explain how that works right here. Let's say, for example, while you're walking down the street, a man pulls a gun on you. The hormone epinephrine, you're familiar with it as adrenaline, it is released into your bloodstream and it gets you to basically be able to sustain some level of defensive reaction. It gets that adrenaline going, gives you that fight or flight response. This works in conjunction with your sympathetic nervous system because it will keep your heart pounding, it will make your muscles tense, and it will make you ready to go to react if it is necessary in that situation. So hopefully this example was beneficial in seeing just how much they work together. In everyday ordinary functioning though, your endocrine system is going to work more so with the parasympathetic nervous system since more often than not, we're not in full-blown times of stress every day, all day than it will that sympathetic nervous system. Only in times of stress will it work with that. Hormones, then, are the chemical messengers of the endocrine system. And these are synthesized by various different glands within the endocrine structure, and we'll get into what those are. They're secreted into your bloodstream, okay? So, very important that you keep in mind for yourself the difference, then, between hormones and neurotransmitters, since they're both chemicals that are used to send messages in your body. First and foremost, the speed of transmission between these two, very different. Hormones, much slower. Neurotransmitters are within seconds of one another that they'll be released and, and operating, okay? So speed of transmission, very, very important. Length of influence is also significant in terms of difference. Hormones will last much longer. It can take anywhere from weeks or days or months for them to become active. Um, for neurotransmitters, it's a very brief duration that they're working. And the last difference is method of transmission. In this structure, the endocrine system and hormones, they're going to be released through the bloodstream. And for no transmitters, those are released in neurons. The pituitary is located right under your hypothalamus. It's this thing right here. It looks kind of like a beak. The pituitary is under the control of your hypothalamus. And so it's going to send out hormone signals to the other glands in your body, such as your pancreas or um, adrenal glands or things like that, um, to let them know that they need to be functioning and to carry out certain processes. Your thyroid and your parathyroid glands are going to work to regulate your metabolism. So metabolism is basically your energy level, your body's energy level. If you have a low metabolism, that means you get tired very easily and typically you gain weight more easily. If you have a high metabolism, that means that you have a fairly high energy level and typically you end up losing quite a bit of weight. It's difficult for you to keep it on because you have such a high energy rate going on in your body. Your thyroid and your parathyroid also work on dealing with physical growth as you age uh, and also your development and your calcium rate. So. For women, as they age and go through menopause, their thyroids are particularly impacted and their calcium rates are influenced as well because these are controlled by thyroids and glands. Your adrenal glands and your pancreas work in conjunction with one another. The adrenal glands are what are going to regulate that fight or flight response to get you geared up for dealing with that stress. And it also helps with metabolism. Your pancreas, which is right down here. This is going to regulate your level of blood sugar. We call that glucose. And so this is very important because issues with your pancreas can lead to things like diabetes. So it's very important to keep that in mind. The reproductive organs are referred to as the gonads. These regulate your bodily development. So in boys, it is the testes, and for girls, it is your ovaries. Okay, so it regulates these bodily developments and it also maintains these reproductive systems. So um, these are what are going to, as we said, regulate reproductory processes. It's important to know that the hormone that is released within these systems, for boys it is testosterone from the testes, and for girls it is estrogen and progesterone, and that is regulated by the ovaries. So this was the set of notes on the nervous system and endocrine system. If you have any questions, just let me know.